tell us more about yourself. For sure. So as related to psychedelics, um, I started a company in 2012 called Liberty Root Therapy Limited in Vancouver, British Columbia. And Liberty Root was dedicated to providing a psychedelic plant medicine called Ibogaine mm -hmm. to people, mostly for opioid use disorder. So it's really good at helping people overcome heroin addiction, right. as an example. And I started that company after years of looking at how I might be able to give back with my life. And Ibogaine came on the radar as a way to potentially help. And I was able to legally work with that in Canada from 2012 mm. through until 2017. In 2017, it was rescheduled and I haven't been able to legally work with it since. But through that work, I was invited to be on the board of directors for MAPS Canada. MAPS is the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. And it's based in the US, but there's a small Canadian branch as well. So I was uh, chair of the board for that organization for almost three years. And we also formed another organization, which is the Canadian Psychedelic Association. So that was formed about uh, a year and a half ago. And we can go into more detail on why and how that was formed a little bit later. But um, yeah, just through that work, I've, I've sat with approximately 300 people in total uh, through different psychedelic journeys. And this is mm. the therapeutic use of psychedelics. It's not, uh, it's not partying with them, although <laughs> psychedelics can be fun as well, but that's not really the context I've been involved in professionally with them. Can you like uh, give us like basic about psychedelics that, like I said, that uh, the heroin or the drugs, like the go can get us high you know is is not uh, what you do but you may call it like oh, heal, help people heal people and yeah so the therapeutic so the word psychedelic means mind or soul manifesting so a psychedelic substance is one that you take that can radically change your perception of reality as it were and it's these substances have been used ceremonially for centuries in different indigenous contexts. Um, in Brazil, ayahuasca has been used in the jungle for centuries. In Africa, the plant medicine uh, that I worked with called iboga, it's been used for centuries. And it's always used for healing. Mm. It's used in a pro-social context and really generally used to make the world better. And in the, in the early, mid, late 60s, early 70s, um, psychedelics were kind of largely outlawed around the world. There was backlash because the, the kind of counter culture movement in the US in the 60s had started taking a lot of LSD as an example. And they really fueled the anti-war movement and the establishment at the time thought, wow, we need to shut this down. So psychedelics were really demonized and made illegal and research stopped on them. But in the last 20 years or so, there we're going through what's being called a, a psychedelic renaissance. And the psychedelic renaissance is really picking up on research that was happening within a Western context from um, the late 50s, early 60s, a lot of research was done on um, LSD as an example. So in, in Canada, there is a, uh, a province called uh, Manitoba and, or no, pardon me, Saskatchewan. And in the late 50s, early 60s, a lot of research was done in Weyburn, Saskatchewan around using LSD to treat things like alcohol use disorder, as an example. So they treated more than 700 people for um, drinking, using LSD, and they had a more than 50% success rate. So there is, there was a history of using these substances therapeutically, even within the Western context, prior to them being outlawed in the mid 60s. And then from there, like I said, in the last 20 years or so, there's been a psychedelic renaissance. So research has started again. 
uh, Johns Hopkins University and Dr. Roland Griffiths. He was one of the first ones to get permission to study psilocybin again. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And when these substances are used in a therapeutic context, context like I say, it's not just taking some mushrooms or some LSD and going to a party. It's, it's taking mushrooms or psilocybin or LSD, putting on a blindfold, putting on headphones with a playlist, having a therapist there sitting and holding space for you. And you really going inside yourself for anywhere from six to 12 hours or longer, depending on the substance. And it's very good at helping kind of heal old wounds, like traumatic events that happen to you. Um, I always refer to them as forgiveness medicines. They're very good at helping kind of press the reset on patterns that you are running that maybe aren't serving you anymore, whether it, maybe that does lead to some kind of debilitating addiction or depression. MDMA, the active ingredient in um in ecstasy, the street drug ecstasy, it's now gone through the first results of the FDA approved phase three clinical trial to use MDMA assisted psychotherapy to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. That is now, uh, yeah, it's got great results so far on the mm -hmm. phase three study. So MDMA will be a prescription within three to five years, we're guessing. And psilocybin is being used to treat treatment-resistant depression as well. So that's in a phase two clinical trial right now, I believe. So that's, uh, you know, therapeutic psychedelics in a nutshell, I guess. You know, what is that environment important uh, when, when you take psychedelics? Absolutely. Yeah, so a, a two key factors that you need to establish prior to a therapeutic session is you need to focus on the set and the setting. Mm. So the set rever refers to the mindset of the person going into the experience. You know, your mindset might just be, I want to party. Your mindset might be, um, you know, I want to heal myself. So there's a lot of work that can be done prior to the session to make sure that your mindset is in a really good place to experience the medicine. And the setting then is the place that you take the substance, which, you know, maybe a rave is a good place to do one of these substances, depending on your intent and the set that you would like to go into the experience with. But as far as a therapeutic setting is concerned, um, often it's done in an office or a comfortable home and somebody will just lie on a bed and it's really dedicated towards healing. Um, the other context is the ceremonial context. Mm -hmm. So ayahuasca, as an example, is often done in a group at nighttime in a yurt or a maloka and people go through the experience together. So yeah, it, the setting, the place through which you do the substance, it can have a huge impact. And when, when we talk about, people have heard about bad trips, bad trips are often the result of poor preparation around set and setting. Um, you know, if you're doing LSD, I don't know, and then have to go have dinner with your parents or something. <laughs> I know that might not be the best situation to put yourself in on a substance like that. But if you take a substance like this and I have a full intent to heal, um, you have somebody there sitting for you, even if you go through a challenging experience, it might still be good for you and often is therapeutically. It mentioned that uh, in the late 60s, 70s, it was like uh, illegal, made, made, made Ill illegal. But uh, before that, uh, why this uh, hip, is it called the like, hippie community uh, start using uh, psychedelics or so LSD and uh, other stuff? Well, I think anybody that experiences LSD within a, a good context tends to have a good time and tends to feel 
Um, a sense of unity is a very common experience. Uh, a sense of realizing, yeah, unity, that we're all one thing, that it's love that binds us and holds us together. So these are all very compelling insights once you've experienced them. And it's, there's been a lot of evidence to show that, you know, the environmental movement and wanting to take care of the planet, a lot of the people that started that environmental movement were greatly impacted by psychedelic experiences and feeling that sense of wholeness and wonder. Um, the, you know, kind of the Pied Piper of, of psychedelics was uh, Timothy Leary. He was a Harvard professor who experienced psilocybin, mescaline, and then LSD. And he was a big proponent of using these substances to tear down power structures that might be oriented towards war or other, you know, unsustainable practices. So I think that's, that was another appealing thing for people in the mid 60s was seeing that, uh, you know, kind of waking up to the, to the fact that the life they had been pr preparing for maybe wasn't going to be the healthiest thing for them to do. So yeah, mm -hmm. impossible for me to put my finger on all the reasons why the hippies took LSD, but there's a few of them. <laughs> okay. But uh, if I think on like hipster, I think like look at it like, a, let's say, flower children and a little bit negative image, but uh, is it like, uh, because like, like say, mainstream media or establishment put us in you know, our, our mind or it was like a hipster, the hippie community did something wrong and they didn't like use psychedelics more, let's say, responsi responsibly. Can you like mm. uh, tell me more about that? Well, I think, you know, I think there was, there was what happened with the counterculture in the 60s. And then there was the backlash against that counterculture in the 60s. And that really, that's where the war on drugs came from. And they kind of lumped all drugs into one category and that category was bad. And then there was tremendous publicity and propaganda mm -hmm. used to promote that war on drugs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the major media outlets, you know, even Time Magazine in the early days had a, had a cover story about LSD saying how how it was a wonder drug as it were but then you know 10 short years later or so they are talking about how you know lsd is horrible and and timothy leary is the most dangerous man on earth mm -hmm. so i think it's just uh it was a knee-jerk reaction that went too far and it was a very successful propaganda campaign mm -hmm. so you know we're still talking about it here now it, trying to ensure people that don't worry psychedelics aren't that dangerous in fact they may be a solution to the global mental health crisis we're facing right now okay but I, like i said you now it's like a, a new the psychedelic renaissance but uh what why uh I'd say what are you trying to do different here compared to like the counter counter movement like so make sure mm. that uh, there will be no so strong black left Backlash. Yeah, for sure. It seems for one within this psychedelic renaissance, as it's being called, not many people that I've heard are talking about using these substances recreationally. It's always within a therapeutic context that that these com conversations, at least in my professional life, mm. are happening. Again, I'm I'm not saying that's the only way these substances need to be used, but when we're talking to and with doctors and scientists and researchers, all people who very much care about what can be done to make the world a better place and heal the suffering people within it, it's just undeniable and the, the science is really showing that these substances are incredibly good at treating post-traumatic stress disorder as an example in the phase two 
clinical trial for MDMA for PTSD that MAPS did. After uh, two sessions of LSD with the psychotherapeutic component, more than 78% or 78% of people no longer qualified as having post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. So that's, and you, in order to get into that study, you had to have really bad PTSD. <laughs> like it wasn't just minor. So people who care have a hard time denying that kind of evidence. And even people who might be kind of conservative leaning and might have a, a reaction to, to using psychedelics in a, in a good way, they are the same kind of people who appreciate science. And when you can show them the data that says, look, this is working again and again and again, then that's, that's just undeniable. I've been mm. on a campaign right now uh, speaking to Canadian politicians about using, about creating more access to psychedelic therapy. And the, the avenue that we're taking is Canada has medical assistance in dying legislation. So basically assisted suicide, doctor supported suicide for people with terminal illnesses. So we have been, because that law has been around for five years now, it's up for parliamentary review. And th that means uh, there's a committee that's been formed to look at this legislation. And we are trying to get psychedelic therapy included as a part of the conversation. Because again, the science shows that for people who have terminal illnesses, to do a therapeutic psilocybin session can greatly reduce end of life anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to enhance the quality of lives of Canadians. So we've been speaking to, I've spoken to, I think a, I think 10 politicians myself in the last couple of weeks with a, a small coalition. And I think the group itself has talked to about 25 people in total and even there was a conservative politician. He must be 70 or older. Uh, he'd been a farmer his whole life in rural Saskatchewan, fairly new to politics. And one of the people on the call opened the call by saying, well, we're here to talk about a, a bit of a weird topic today. And this guy responds, he goes, not anymore. Everybody's talking about this right now. Mm. So even the more kind of right-wing conservative politicians are, they find it hard to deny that these substances are very powerful at helping people overcome otherwise in, intractable diseases. So pretty much because like, there are like so much data behind it that supports that, that there are like a lot of benefits uh, with, uh, in using psychedelics. Uh, but this all is still like other group of like, uh, say, people who like, no, no matter what, we like, we don't want them. And uh, mm -hmm. do you have like any experience with those people, people as well? Um, I'm not really finding that these mm -hmm. days. Like I've been professionally involved in this space for almost 10 years now. And back when I first started working with psychedelics, in fact, I, I was part of a training course. I, I was an instructor on a training course around psychedelic therapy for a bunch of professionals on uh, just this last Tuesday night. This came up and the question about stigma and how do you deal with stigma and the way some people feel about psychedelics? How do you deal with that? And I, my answer to that is just be glad you weren't around 10 years ago, because th that's when there was a lot of stigma. My mom's a, a nurse practitioner. So when I told her I was opening up a clinic, giving psychedelics mm -hmm. to people, she thought I was crazy. And now she's come around and she sees mm -hmm. the benefit of it herself. And mm -hmm. I think if, I think if we were just making up the, the benefits of these substances, we'd have a harder path ahead of us, but we're not. Like the transformations I've seen with these substances are just undeniable. The, the science is there. It's starting to be there. We still do need more science, but I don't need science. I've given, I've given these substances to 
200 people for opiate use disorder, more for other things. And I've seen a 40 to 60% success rate helping get mm. people off heroin using Ibogaine. So the transformations I've seen are, they're undeniable. How would you end up like uh, opening this uh, psychedelic uh, therapeutic uh, clinic uh, legally? At, uh, how was the legislation said, okay, no, you can't, um, how would this happen? Um, so Ibogaine, which is the plant medicine I was able to legally work with, it was registered in Canada as a natural health product. So it wasn't an illegal substance. And I was able to legally work with it as a natural health product from 2012 through until 2017. And I, and then in 2017, Health Canada put it onto the prescription drug list which is actually the proper place for it because a natural health product shouldn't be potentially dangerous. And Ibogaine is, I think the one psychedelic that does have a, you can, it does have a toxic level that you can take. So it should really never have been a natural health product, but I was able to, you know, while it was, I was able to work with it and we did it within a medicalized context. So we had doc a doctor that worked with us and we had nurses who would come in during the experience. Ibogaine is a very interesting molecule. It comes from the Iboga shrub, Tabernanthi Iboga from West Africa. And it's been used there ceremonially for centuries. It's a uh, root bark that from this shrub that is used to induce the psychoactive effects. And it, um, it, like I say, it was used ceremonially for centuries. And then in the early 1960s, somebody in New York City who was physically dependent on heroin, he took Ibogaine because he was just looking to try something new. He was curious. And he went on a powerful journey. It puts you on anywhere from a 24 to 36 hour long psychedelic trip. But he came out the other end and he said, wait a second, I haven't wanted heroin the whole time I've been on this, nor do I want it now. So that's when its anti-addictive properties were discovered. And he really got a lot of people's attention around the fact that this could be a great cure for addiction. And um, yeah, so I was able to work with people, mostly people who were opiate dependent and it really helps people get through withdrawals quite painlessly and gives them a chance to make new decisions after the reset button has been pressed, as it were. But um, how much uh, the quantity is, uh, how much did uh, you give them? At, like like uh, small doses or large doses? Uh, how the, how does it work? I, well, I would bring people in for 10 days at a time and they would like I say, mostly be opiate dependent. So our doctor would prescribe morphine upon arrival so that they would stay on morphine so that they didn't go into withdrawals. And we would stabilize them on morphine for a day or so. Then we would start working with small amounts of Ibogaine, which takes away the withdrawal symptoms for a day or so. And we would taper them off the morphine for a couple of days using low doses of Ibogaine before the next day, which is when we would bring in the registered nurse and do what's called the flood dose. So that's right. a larger amount of medicine that really puts people on this 36 hour long journey, mm. after which they get a decent night's sleep, and then they start feeling quite a bit better over the next few days. But, you know, quantity wise, a low dose might be 100 to 500 milligrams, and a larger dose might be a, a gram to a gram and a half to two grams of medicine, but it all depends on the, the patient and where they're at. Why are the, those experiences lasting so long? Like you said, like 12 hours, 18 hours, 16 hours, like why they're so long? That's just what Iboga does. Like ah. it, to, take, to take magic mushrooms, it would be about a six hour journey to take LSD, it's about a 12 hour journey. To take mescaline, like peyote, it's about a 12 hour journey. Um, and then Iboga is kind of the granddaddy of them all. It's a 36 hour long trip. It's mm. it's not for the faint hearted. Have you ever like uh, 
tried psychedelics on uh, people who like like depression or mental illnesses mm-hmm. and uh, how are they like uh, do like so have like say you before they give you the doses do like okay can we give them or not that do like can we like guidelines what you look or not so um you know there's there's certain contraindications for certain psychedelics so if somebody if somebody is on pretty much any prescription medicine prior to an ibogaine treatment i'll have them come off that prescription medication and they'll do that taper supported by their doctor um antidepressants like ssris they like prozac they don't generally go very well with psychedelics so if you're taking an SSRI and then take magic mushrooms, you might not feel the magic mushrooms mm-hmm. as much. So, you know, there's often contraindications and we need to get people off medications before they do a journey like this. Um, otherwise, a rule of thumb is you don't treat anybody with really acute mental disorders. Like if they have a very symptomatic case of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, we would generally not give people with those ailments psychedelics, mm-hmm. although there are exceptions to the rule. And I've heard some pretty incredible accounts of mm-hmm. bipolar disorder getting completely fixed by a, a high dose of LSD. I've heard of a, a schizophrenic patient who microdoses LSD and the voices don't go away. They just get a lot friendlier when he's <laughs> microdosing. So, um, you know, the rule of thumb so far, and again, as we're able to do more proper research, these these rules may change, but you generally just want somebody to be relatively stable prior to going mm-hmm. into something like this. But if they're depressed, that's one of the great, great things to do to overcome the depression. A way I often describe these medicines is it's not as if they add anything to anyone. Um, You don't generally take a psychedelic and all of a sudden you're given a superpower to deal with the world. It's more like as we live life, it's like we see life through a pane of glass, like Mm -hmm. a filter of some sort. And when, you know, when you suffer, when your heart gets broken, when you get let down by life or your perception of life, that filter or that glass gets dirty. And these medicines, it's it's not like they add anything to you. It's more like they clean that glass from the inside out. And once that glass has been cleaned, you're like, oh, actually, life is quite awesome. And mm-hmm. you're kind of empowered and have the tools needed to, to handle life properly again, once that windshield has been cleaned. So I think that's largely what it does for a depressed patient is a a depressed person gets in negative feedback loops of thinking. And that's, that's the equivalent of the dirty glass that I'm talking about. And the, these substances seem to get rid of that or interrupt that pattern. They're very powerful pattern interrupters. Mm. Okay. So let's move on to the, about the psychedelic association. Okay, at, uh, how you end up start founding the CPA? For sure. So we started, it grew out of a retreat that uh, there were 32 people at. It happened in British Columbia here. Most of us lived in Vancouver. And we are people that had been members of this so-called psychedelic community for some time in some way, shape or form. And somehow semi-professionally involved in the psychedelic space. And we came together because cannabis legalization happened in Canada. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we saw when cannabis was legalized in Canada is that a lot of the original players, a lot of the people who were the trailblazers and had a lot to do with ultimately cannabis being accepted, they were kind of pushed out of the equation as big money and big corporations came into the space. So we came together with one, at least that item on the agenda, which is how do we prevent a lot of the the stuff that we saw happen with cannabis legalization? How do we prevent that from happening within the psychedelic space? So 
we had a great three day retreat and decided to keep the conversation going. A few of us kept meeting week after week to see what we might put together. And the Canadian Psychedelic Association was born out of that. So it was registered as a nonprofit on December 31st, 2019, right before crazy 2020 started happening. <laughs> and uh, from there, we just have an incredible team. Our board of directors is, they're all dear friends now. Um, we've got a physician on the team, Dr. Pam Crisco. Pascal Tremblay is our, our website ninja. And uh, Jillian and R Jillian Maxwell, Richard K. they own a retreat center. Salome Tabrizi, um, she is a counselor and works with plant medicines. Ian Michael Hebert, now that I'm listing them all, I got to make sure I do list them all. Um, Ian Michael is a an American actually, who works with plant medicines in Costa Rica and wants to in Canada as well. Um, Jasmine Perazic, she is uh, an indigenous woman who is a super powerful ayahuasquera as well. And Sonia Stringer is uh, a real, she's got an incredible entrepreneurial mindset. Steve Rio is a new board member as well. And I think I list them all. Did I? Yeah, I'm just asking my partner. She's nodding. Um, yeah, so just an incredible group of people who are very dedicated to the ethical unfoldment of this space. And we have a membership. I'm sure we have more than 500 members now. Mm -hmm. We have at least 100 doctors who are a part of our membership, who are all very interested in the mainstreaming of these psychedelics into the medical system. Um, we launched with a campaign towards decriminalization. So I started a, a petition in conjunction with a couple of friends who actually wrote the petition, Chris Bennett and Jovi and Francie. And in Canada, we've got a, an e-petition system where you can create a petition and as long as it gets 500 signatures, it will be read in, in the House of Commons as, as a proposal to the government. So we managed to get 15,000 signatures on this towards the decriminalization of plant medicine specifically. So it was a decriminalized nature petition. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the initiatives. We've done a bunch of webinars through the Canadian Psychedelic Association as well psychedelicassociation.net is our website and there's just we're just trying to be a really great resource and a great beacon for people to find us who are interested in these substances and would like to discover some community who also appreciates them uh, when you talk about decriminalization what we mean by that for sure so there's decriminalization then there's legalization so decriminalization basically is just getting, is, is a quest to remove any criminal uh, repercussions for being involved with these substances. So um, like right now, theoretically, if I had a gram of magic mushrooms in my pocket and the police caught me for some reason, I could be subject to criminal fines and perhaps even jail time. So as we've seen historically, prohibition never works. Like we are, uh, you know, heroin is illegal. Heroin is criminalized. But in Canada and around the world, we're having the biggest opioid tainted drug supply crisis ever. People are dying at incredible rates because these substances are tainted and, and it's the kind of the criminalization of these substances that is, has pushed these substances underground and created this tainted drug supply. Mm. So the efforts towards decriminalization is simply saying that if somebody is caught with these substances, they're not going to be considered a criminal if they do, mm. because, you know, they tried to outlaw alcohol in the, the early 1900s as well. That didn't work. Um, we've tried to outlaw cannabis. We've tried to outlaw all these drugs. It, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make communities safer. It, mm. it doesn't 
get rid of crime. And in fact, it creates even more crime. So by decriminalization, we would hope to make a lot of those factors a bit better. But I have a question that uh, if, you, if you know that uh, this uh, outlawing uh, certain things don't work, why we still keep doing those? Do you like, uh, do well, you it like... works for some people. It works for the police force. Um, well, it, you know, the police get a lot of their budget to fight the so-called war on drugs. Mm. But in fact, the, the Canadian Police Chiefs Association came out with a statement last year saying they want the decriminalization of all drugs as well, mm. because it's simply not working. So there was just a lot of political investment in prohibition overall, and it, it gives certain organizations a lot of power over people. But if you're looking at, at the topic kind of reasonably and rationally, you can see that the war on drugs is an abject failure. Mm -hmm. Drugs won the war on drugs. But is it like, is it because the, the lawmakers like are ignorant or they just uh, heard some rumors and they, they make, okay, you have to ban this. Or what, what was the reason? Like why they- I think, it, I think it grew out of ignorance. I think it grew out of fear. Um, and I'm sure that there are some lawmakers who still are ignorant around the topic, but I think with, with proper re-education and, and learning some of the facts around this stuff, I think even the most ardent conservative could be won over. Hmm. Okay, I, I want to talk, uh, as I remember that uh, uh, when we end up like, uh, US and Canada like a very like strict ways to de like uh, fight against the uh, war on gas drugs. But I remember that uh, they like in, Port in Portugal or Spain or in uh, Switzerland, like the kind of different approach, like uh, mm -hmm. I think I remember correct that in Spain or Portugal, I remember which one that if you like caught the, like uh, a legal substance, like they don't put you in prison, it's okay. It's okay. They bring you, okay, a psychologist, the other official, and okay, why you mm -hmm. did it? Uh, let's find out the reason and so on. And mm -hmm. But uh, why uh, Canadians haven't, like, uh, per se, failed to, like, learn from other countries mm -hmm. uh, what they have made successfully? Well, Portugal is the country that has decriminalized all drugs. And they, if, like you say, if you're caught with a drug, you will be put into health care basically mm. or addiction care i hear there's uh there's definitely some imperfections in that model from what i've heard but they've definitely saved many lives by mm. doing it nonetheless so it's a step in the right direction um and i think canada is just you know just the the governing party is reluctant to change uh, the city of Vancouver and other municipalities in Canada have, at the municipal level, voted to uh, end the war on drugs, to, to decriminalize these substances, and we're just waiting on federal approval to do that within Vancouver city limits, basically. It, it would be a, a section 56 exemption to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which would allow access to all drugs within Vancouver itself in order to try and end this opioid crisis. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's just, people are slow to change and it, it does take a, an education process and mm. we're not quite all the way there yet with it. Yeah. But uh, what does like a current roadblock? Okay, okay. We are talking phone. Uh, other ones, but what are the other uh, roadblocks? I think I think public education is a huge hmm. piece of the puzzle. In Canada, as mentioned, cannabis was legalized two years ago, and the reason why cannabis was legalized is people had been fighting that for that for a long time, but it was only once polls started saying that 51% of Canadians and more 
wanted legalization that it actually happened because the politicians they're going to do what they do which is make sure that they get the votes and if all of a sudden a majority starts looking for changes then they're willing to make the change themselves mm -hmm. we're probably not quite there yet with psychedelics i although some recent polls indicates we're pretty close mm -hmm. so i think that will be a, a big piece of the puzzle is just getting the general public more on board and then i think it's i i I really do think decriminalization will happen within Canada within the next couple of years. There's a private members bill that's forward right now by a liberal MP, um, Bill C-20 towards the decriminalization of all substances. And that, you know, I, psychedelics aren't gonna be able to take credit for this. It's because we are in uh, an opioid crisis with people mm -hmm. dying every day that decriminalization is getting traction. Hopefully we can curb the tide of deaths that are happening, this literal bloodbath that's happening by making the substances themselves not illegal anymore so that people should theoretically be able to source a cleaner supply mm. would be the hope with something like that. Um, beyond that, there are some, you know, are, there are roadblocks that we're going to face, but it's interesting, like there's just, there's many different avenues that are happening right now. The legalization of these substances through medicalization is happening. That, that movement is taking one step in the right direction every single day. There is the decriminalization route. There's people fighting for that. That's steps in the right direction. We are talking to members of parliament through the Canadian Psychedelic Association to get psychedelics included in the medical assistance and dying legislation. That's a step in the right direction. So there are some blocks I've, I've learned in working with governments now that change does not happen in an instant. It happens incrementally. And I think we're, we're playing all our cards very smartly in having that incremental change actually happen. But uh, one thing I uh, also don't talk about, uh, I heard, uh, one of the first uh, episodes I was to do was to talk about uh, like microdoses, that yeah. like a very big, big thing in psychedelic community. That uh, why like uh, psycho this microdosing like is like very like big impact our like uh, conscious awareness or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's microdosing is taking a, a sub perceptual amount of the substance, generally about one tenth of a dose. Mm. Um, so maybe 10 to 20 milligrams of LSD or 100 to 200 milligrams of magic mushrooms. And th that's taking enough medicine that you, you almost don't feel it. It's, mm. it's, often called a sub perceptual dose. So just below actually sensing it in your perception, but it seems to have a, a levitating effect. It, it can be an, uh, an antidepressant. It can make you happier. It can make your vision a bit clearer and just makes you a little bit more present during the day is what people often say around microdosing. There is, um, there's a couple of studies that came out recently, one from the Imperial College in London seemed to indicate that microdosing was no stronger than a placebo effect. Mm. Um, you know, that was just one study. I'm not sure I believe that anybody who's done microdosing can, you can see that there's a little bit more than the placebo effect happening for sure. Um, and then there's another study that is done by the guys at Quantified Citizen in conjunction with famous mycologist Paul Stamets and their team. And they've done, they launched a, a microdose app. So microdose.me is an app you can download and then you can register yourself into an ongoing study on microdosing. And they've collected a lot of data. At least 10,000 people have participated already. And what they're showing with microdosing, a really interesting and, and uh, objective measure is you can, uh, there's a tap test, 
that is very common for people with um, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease. You'll, you'll tap something as quick as you can. So the cell phone can pick that up very easily and do, do a measurement on your tapping. And what they found with people who microdose is, and this hasn't been published yet, but I was at a conference and heard this data, that for people who are young, younger, 25 to 50 years old kind of thing, the improvement on the tap test for after you microdose is very minimal. But if you are older, kind of 50 to 65 and you microdose, your tap test results go up quite dramatically. Mm. So one of the one of the things people are investigating around these substances is kind of their anti-aging effects and how they might help with diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I've seen ibogaine microdosing work very well for people with Parkinson's disease. So I think there is, uh, there's a lot to be said for microdosing. There's a lot of, a lot of potential there. It, it may help neurogenesis, might help your brain grow new connections. If you are locked in in the present, how it will change your perception of the world? Well, you know, most of us are not very present. We we're constantly in our minds. I'm the worst for it. We're looking all over the place. We are doing everything we can to escape the present moment and microdosing. And it's not the only thing. Meditation is another great thing just helps you actually be in your body a little bit more. And once you're in your body a little bit more, you, your perception is enhanced because you're not distracted. You don't have a lack of focus. So microdosing arguably brings you more into the present moment, which just makes you more well attuned to life as it is rather than kind of the illusions that you're spinning in your own mind. Mm -hmm. So how that happens, I don't know. Why that happens, I don't know. But you can speak to people who have microdosed and they'll just say, yeah, it's just somebody, somebody wrote a book called a very good day, I think is what the book was called. And it was all about her experience with microdosing. And her experience was when she microdosed, she just tend to have a really good day. And it, mm. you don't feel high, you just feel good. Some like uh, you were mostly like uh, very high, like it's like, okay, it's great, kind of have a good day. But yeah. is it uh, like uh, the effect is like uh, temporary or like permanent? Um, some people would say that it's the day after microdosing that they actually feel the best. Um, I would say it's, it really depends on yourself and your work and the, the spiritual work you've been doing. Um, I think a, a good protocol is to do a large dose of something like mushrooms therapeutically first and that's going to do a lot to create shifts in your life. And then you can follow that up with microdosing every now and then. And I always advise people to just do microdosing organically. You don't have to have a, a set rule on when you do it. Um, you just do it whenever you feel like you might feel called to, to microdosing. Okay. So uh, before we wrap things up at... Uh... Uh, if you like, uh, someone has like uh, interest to my uh, my uh, psychedelics. Uh, what do you recommend for them? That they where to go, what to do research, and so on. I would um, recommend going to psychedelicassociation.net. And even if you're not Canadian, you're welcome to join that network of amazing people. We've got a social media platform that's off Facebook that we've got a very active community in, and. I think that's overall my advice is to find psychedelic community within your own region. There are often different smaller associations and societies of people who are interested in this. Um, if you can't find one, start your own. I know a bunch of people who started their own and now they're real beacons of, uh, of light in their own communities. And yeah, I think that's, 
that's probably the best advice is just to find like-minded people. And mm -hmm. in the age of social media, it's not all that hard to find. Just mm -hmm. go onto Facebook and see if you can find a local psychedelic group. And if you can't find one, just start one and people will find you. Um, so, but uh, if like a uh, person like, uh, is not to say very comfortable with uh, psychedelics or any like this uh, allogenetic alu alu drugs, what you would recommend then? I would say start by doing a lot of research. If you're curious, there's loads of resources. The book, How to Change Your Mind by, by Michael Pollan is a really good entry level story of psychedelics and how they help people therapeutically. Um, there's lots of good movies. I'm featured in a movie called Dosed. It's a documentary about one woman's experience using these substances to overcome her addictions. Uh, dosedmovie.com, you can rent that through there. Um, there's a, a beautiful film on YouTube called A New Understanding, The Science of Psilocybin. It's about using psilocybin for end of life anxiety. There's a great documentary on YouTube called Hoffman's Potion that the National Film Board of Canada put out in the early 2000s. It's a really sweet documentary. So I think the more research you do, the more you'll find that these aren't su scary substances, although they do need to be treated with respect. Mm. You, you could put yourself in a really poor situation if you don't plan properly. Um, unfortunately, most of these substances are still illegal. So you might have a hard time finding substance you can trust. That's why I recommend getting in touch with your local community and making some friends that you can trust that might be able to point you in a good direction that way. Mm. But it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. At the same time, if you do it right, you can kind of take it lightly because these substances are um, very enlightening, as it were. But Trevor, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I uh, hope you're doing uh, great with your mission. Thank you. It's an honor to, uh, to be on this miss mission and I'm happy to share it with the world. So thanks so much for having me on your show. Hey, thank you. So bye. Take care. Bye-bye.